She stops and she starts. She contradicts herself. She goes backwards and forwards. What she says doesn't make sense. Or when she's describing it, she's not crying. She's not upset. She's like totally flat. The victim that may appear, as if she may not have the story all together. Often survivors are asked, well, why didn't you just run out the door or tell someone or scream or, or say no? Um, but what, what, has, um, what I've heard survivors talk about is um, feeling a sense of just even just frozen. There is no typical response to sexual assault. So if victims can remember things differently, they don't necessarily remember things chronologically. Uh, they may get things out of order. I knew from my research as a psychologist what they were actually seeing was trauma. What they were seeing was the neurobiology of trauma. As law enforcement officers, we recognize that this is not just a job, it's a calling. Seeking justice, helping people, and making a difference are all part of what makes this profession so rewarding. More than 30 years of police work and my time as a national advisor and trainer on sexual assault have taught me that the first interaction between a law enforcement officer and a sexual assault victim will make or break our opportunities for success and justice in these cases. Our first interactions with victims also have a profound impact on a victim's ability to recover from the trauma of sexual assault, making this one of the most complex violent crimes that we respond to. Unfortunately, many of us didn't receive the in-depth training needed to respond effectively to these cases. We often misinterpreted victims' reactions to trauma, which discouraged victims from participating in the criminal justice system and resulted in offenders not being held accountable for their crimes. Much like we are more informed today about police officer trauma following critical incidents, research and experience informs us that we need to educate ourselves on the science behind sexual assault victims' reactions to trauma. Sexual assault response and investigations training has now advanced to include a trauma-informed approach to sexual assault. This will help us understand sexual assault victims' actions, responses, and their ability to recall details of the crime. In part one of this two-part training, we will learn how trauma impacts victims' behavior, memory, and cognitive ability. In part two, we'll talk about how to use what we've learned to respond more effectively in sexual assault cases. Let's start with a look at how the brain responds to trauma. So during a traumatic situation, there are two basic neurobiological processes that we're interested in looking at. One is what hormones are released and how does that affect behavior during the assault and the immediate aftermath of the assault. And then what is happening with respect to the memory of that traumatic event. Most survivors are going to have one of four main stress chemicals released in their bodies or some have multiple hormones and chemicals released at the time of the assault one of which are going to be the catecholamines. Catecholamines are like natural adrenaline. It's what pumps your body up in a traumatic or stressful situation that would help a survivor be able to fight back against the attacker or try to flee from the situation. Another hormone that's often released for survivors during an assault are the corticosteroids. And those work in conjunction with the catecholamines to determine how much energy is available. So again, for some survivors, they have a lot of energy available to fight back and to flee and they stay very pumped up after the assault. But some don't. It sort of bottoms out and flattens out on them and they might freeze during the assault or they might be in kind of a stupor almost after the assault. Other hormones that affect the behavior at the time of the assault are opiates, which is like natural morphine. So some survivors during the assault report feeling like they're almost drugged, that they're out of it. And then when they do first responder interviews later, they, they have no affect, they're just describing it with no emotion, no affect, you know, like they're reading out of the TV guide, there's just nothing to them. That's the opiates. The opiates help block physical pain, which you need during a traumatic situation, but they also just keep blunting everything, okay? The other hormone that's sometimes released is oxytocin, and this is a hormone that promotes good feelings. Okay, and that may sound strange, or why would you have a hormone that's about good feelings released during a sexual assault? Again, it's about trying to block the pain, the physical pain, the psychological pain. So the body will release opiates, natural morphine, to try to tamp down the physical pain, and sometimes it will release oxytocin in conjunction with that to try to balance it out. Hormone that promotes good feelings, hormone that tries to blunt pain. Again, it's just trying to mitigate the pain of this assault. But if the oxytocin levels get a little high, sometimes survivors might laugh, giggle, um, smile, 
um, engage in socially appropriate behavior that's socially inappropriate given that situation. You may see a survivor who um, may be very tearful. You may see a survivor who um, may be laughing just to get through. You may see a survivor who's maybe looks as though she's um, or he or she is very um, uncooperative, very angry or resistant. Victims can display a huge range of emotions. Um, they can appear to be apathetic, where a, an officer may think that, you know, she should be acting differently than this. The, the, just because they're apathetic about it doesn't mean it's not affecting them. It's just the way they're dealing with it. We've all had the experience of talking to victims of trauma who've said and done things that didn't make sense to us. However, as we've just learned, the flood of hormones that help us survive a trauma also affect behavior during and after a traumatic event. So, what we once may have seen as confusing behavior from victims, we can now understand as actually evidence of trauma. So in addition to affecting behavior, this flood of hormones changes how the brain stores memory and how those memories are later recalled. So those are the four hormones that can affect the behavior during the assault. And these hormones are really instrumental in blocking the physical pain, helping the body react to the trauma of the assault. Now here's the kicker. Those four hormones, very helpful in so many ways, when those four hormone levels are very high in the body, it interferes with other structures in your brain that are trying to lay down the neural mechanisms of the memory. So it's one of those times where our body's kind of working at cross purposes. Those hormones are really helpful for fight, for flight, for mitigating the pain, but they cause cellular damage in two key structures of our brain that work to lay down a memory. What we've learned from the neurobiology of trauma research is, is, is that the memories of traumatic events are stored in a very disorganized way. When a survivor sits down and tries to explain to either a responding officer or detective what happened in the assault and it starts coming out in this bits and pieces fragmented way of they start one thing but then they stop abruptly and then they start talking about something else or they start explaining it very generally and then they start throwing in random details. It can be very confusing for law enforcement and a lot of law enforcement based on other training they've had will look at that and say this looks suspicious to me because it seems like they're making it up as they're going along. They're not making it up as they're going along, they're having difficulty recalling the different pieces of the assault because of the way the trauma of the assault affected the way the memory is laid down. So for law enforcement, they see this completely disorganized, discombobulated presentation and they say, uh-uh, I'm not believing this. This seems made up to me. What they're really seeing is evidence of trauma. What they're really seeing is how trauma impacts memory formation and then memory recall. So I think it's important for law enforcement to keep in mind that when they see that really confusing stop, start, disorganized presentation, to think about that, that what they're seeing is trauma. What they're seeing is a survivor trying to reach into the different pieces and parts of their brain and all the different fragments of that memory, and they're doing their best to put it together and to give it back. Now the important thing to keep in mind is, is that the research is very clear that the accuracy of the memory is intact. So even though the storage is fragmented and can come out kind of sounding confusing and in bits and pieces, the actual recall, accurate. It may come off that they're being dishonest or because they deviated from their statement and gave you something totally different or they've left out something. Doesn't mean that they're being evasive or that they're not being truthful about what took place. Unfortunately, law enforcement were trained to the ask the who, what, when, where, and how. Unfortunately, victims don't process these memories that way. You never know what a victim of sexual assault will remember, particularly in that initial interview with you as the first responder. Don't be concerned if it appears to be an inconsistent statement or fragmented interview that she gives you. It's my job as a prosecutor to explain and educate those inconsistencies to a jury, particularly in the context of how the trauma she experienced may have influenced her behavior or her memory. What you see as inconsistencies or fragmented information, I see as evidence of trauma. I personally talk to victims where they've left out perpetrators, where there may be two or three guys that assaulted them they may key on one perpetrator.
because that perpetrator may have been the one that was the most damaging to the victim. And she may have forgotten about the other two. She may leave them out and then they'll bring it up. Number two, help me. The second guy helped me. Well, when did the second guy come in? Where did the second guy come from? Oh, I didn't tell you that. No, you, you didn't tell me that. We need to back up and tell me about the second guy. Well, he didn't do much to me. He helped me. So don't get wrapped up in the fact that maybe there's inconsistent statements as far as the chronological order, who was there, things like that. Because we expect to see that. That doesn't mean that the victim's lying to you. It just simply means that what you're asking them wasn't that important to them to really pay attention to that particular detail. One way to explain how trauma affects memory is with a simple example of post-it notes. Let's say that listening to this interview, you were trying to write down the information. And let's say rather than a nice tablet of paper, all I gave you was a post-it note, a little tiny post-it note. And that all you could do was write down the notes from this interview on post-it notes. Well, depending upon the size of the post-it note, you might be able to get a few words written down. You might, if you got a good size post-it note, you might be able to get several sentences down. Or if you got a good size post-it note, you'd be able to write many, many different things, okay? Now I want you to imagine trying to write down all the notes from this interview on post-it notes. And I want you to gather them all up and I want you to take them to a desk, the world's messiest desk, because that's really what the human brain is. And I want you to take all these little precious post-it notes that have your notes on them and I want you to scatter them all over the desk. I want you to put some on top. I want you to stick some underneath in the pile. I want you to put some in the interview that's about sexual assault. I want you to put some that says policies and procedures manual. Obviously misfiled. Scatter it everywhere. Now, imagine trying to come back to that world's messiest desk 24 hours, 36 hours, three weeks, six months later. Find all of the post-it notes, get them, put them in the correct order, and tell it back. That's what we're asking survivors to do when we're asking them to recall a traumatic event, when we're asking them to tell their story. We now know the neurobiology of trauma helps us understand victims' response to sexual assault, such as unexpected emotional demeanor and fragmented memory recall. So what does this mean for first responders? First, every victim responds differently to sexual assault. You can expect a broad range of emotional responses and demeanor from victims during and after the assault from apathetic to distraught and anywhere in between. There is no right or wrong way to respond. Second, expect that victims will not be able to recall the event chronologically or remember details that we may think are important. This is evidence of trauma, not deception. And while the memory may be fragmented, the accuracy of the memory is intact. Third, understand that disclosure is a process. Expect that victims may remember new or different information over time. It's important not to make judgments about credibility or the validity of a case based on a victim's response. In part two of this video, we're going to look at the impact of trauma on cognitive ability and what first responders can do differently.